Good afternoon and welcome to the last day of the 2023 IHF Children's Handball Education Week, where leading experts throughout the world of handball share their knowledge and experience over seven days. This is the seventh webinar. We already have had some very interesting presentations, very interesting topics touched, and very interesting information shared over the last week. My name is Adrian Costeo. I'm a member of the IHF media team, and I was, and I uh, will be your host today too. Uh, during all these uh, webinars, of course, uh, like uh, we've already talk, uh, talked, um, there have been very interesting topics, and we have another one right now uh, at uh, 13 CEST this Sunday uh, in the IHF Education Center. Um, to begin with, we would like to let you know that these sessions uh, are all in English and we have translations available in French, Spanish and Arabic. It's very easy to switch to these uh, languages. There is the uh, interpretation icon uh, button on the bottom of the, your uh, Zoom app. Just click it and choose your preferred language, of course, then you can hear the translation uh, for um, your preferred language. All these sessions fall under the umbrella of the IHF Education Center and all of the webinars are recorded and are available on demand at ihfeducation.ihf.info. So for the last presentation of the 2023 IHF Children's Head Model Education Week, uh, we saved an, interest, an interesting topic, differences between teaching and coaching, uh, which will be presented by Milan Petronievich. Milan, Hello, good afternoon. The floor is yours now. We can't hear you. You're, you are muted. I'm sorry. Now we can. Perfect. Now it's, it's better. Thank you. Now it's better. The okay. floor is yours. Instance, yeah. uh, first of all, I would try, meanwhile, to share my screen. And... Uh, I would like just to have the confirmation from your side that everything works fine. Everything works very, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. First of all, thank you for your invitation to be part of this uh, very important uh, project that I really admire. And I have this lovely opportunity and this privilege to be part of it uh, two years ago when we started this project. Uh, many thanks and also big congratulations uh, to IHF that they are still taking care of it and that started to be a tradition and I hope that there will be many, many additions in the upcoming uh, time. Um, from the other side, I think that the IHF uh, is International Handball Federation showing the great responsibility of caring about the coaches who are working on the grassroots level. So why is it important? Uh, by taking care of our grassroots or our roots, we are absolutely showing that we are taking care about the future. Uh, unfortunately, those sports who do not understand, those sports who are not caring about it, uh, they couldn't really count on the certain future of development of their sport. Uh, this is the last uh, day of this uh, education uh, week. I hope that you have really enjoyed for during the, all the sessions that have be, been done, presented uh, from our, by my colleagues. And uh, yes, I can say that dessert always comes on the end. Uh, but I have to say that uh, I'm very lucky that uh, I am concluded the work of my colleagues who hopefully that hopefully you have followed over those days. Luck is absolutely something that uh, you can't count on it. You never know when it will show and or, or wouldn't show during your work, but it's definitely what we need in our sport. And definitely we are always trying to count on it during our competitions. Why am I so lucky? There are probably three reasons. First of them, uh, uh, probably you are a bit tired working all, all over the uh, week by uh, listening to my colleagues and that you have uh, listened them carefully, I suppose. And probably this is the reason why we won't have many questions after my session. From the other side, I'm also lucky because my wife allowed me to be together with you today, although it's uh, her birthday today and she's making a big celebration. And from the other side, I have to admit that the timing of this session is just perfect because uh, 
I suppose that we're gonna finish this session around 2.30. And this is just the, the time when the Serbian basketball team is playing the, their finals uh, of the World Championship. Uh, why I mentioned basketball, probably you, I will for sure speak only about handball, but what I have learned uh, when I was a student uh, during my faculty of physical education and sports from the teachers that I, I was listening to them carefully and who really had something to present, we learned that we do not only have to take care or probably to follow the development only of our sport. We also have to follow the development of the similar sport disciplines and basketball is absolutely a discipline or sport that uh, has a lot of things in common with our sport. So if you analyze the game in the defense and some individual technical or tactical skills, you will see that there are a lot of elements that are implemented in one and the other. Uh, one of the new elements in the individual elements in the handball individual game is that you probably notice that the players on the top level are uh, also placing themselves in order with the right timing in order to provoke the attacking fault of the players. In, if you are just uh, checking in the past, it was only as a consequence of the mistake or the failure of the players in the attack. And now due to the development of individual skills, also of the cognitive skills, perception, only very, very good players are able to provoke these attacking fouls and they're using it as a very, very powerful, powerful, um, um, powerful element of the game. Back uh, to my, back to my uh, topic. Uh, first of all, uh, we have to speak about the differences in between the uh, coaching uh, and the teaching. And uh, I have to admit that uh, it's a quite uh, wide topic and we can just uh, speak about this copy from the different perspectives. I'm always trying uh, to I'm trying to inspire all those who are following my lectures, doesn't matter if they are live or they are online like we are doing today, which is probably a bigger challenge for the speaker. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to inspire you to make your own thoughts. So if you are making your own thoughts, you can make your own implementation in the individual environments where we are working. And then we are really achieving the best possible goal. So before I start uh, with this topic, I have to uh, speak a little bit uh, just as a kind of theoretical introduction to speak about the development of children, just to understand where we are probably in which parts of their development we are more focusing on teaching and where we are probably focusing more on coaching children. So uh, Generally, in the children's development, we have two basic periods. We have the periods of the fast and then the periods of the slow growth. So in, you know also that probably there is a great individual differences in between the kids about the timing of these periods. So the all kids, they do not enter into this fast growth phase at the same time. So the difference that can be also uh, among different genders. So the girls, they start earlier this phase of the of the fast growth than the than the boys. And what is also very important to understand that usually, especially among the boys, where they are growing probably 10, 15 centimeters during uh, one a year, it's very important to know that the bones very usually are not uh, are, are 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 growing much faster than the muscles, and the muscles not not following this pace. This is why uh, the boys or probably the kids both doesn't matter of their gender. They are at that time using uh, they are uh, missing some kind of the fine coordination, and easily uh, children at that age. You can probably understand them or take them as the ones who are probably a little bit clumsy. But if you're really an expert in this field and if you understand those development rules, you understand that this phase is just a temporary one. So it means that you have to be patient. And from the other side, those kids, you can't have the same treatment or the kids who, have, who are facing these issues with the other ones. 
What is also your task, and we'll speak a little bit more about that, is that you have as experts to follow those sensitive periods in the development of all physical and uh, abilities. What is this? What are the sensitive periods? In the literature, you can find them also uh, named as a golden age. And these are the periods where naturally we have the utmost or great improvement on some uh, physical abilities. So, for example, if you're talking about the in general velocity or speed, we can find that the first period can be in between six and eight years. What does it mean? If you use in this period the tools in order to develop those abilities, you will achieve tremendous results in their development that you can't make before or afterwards. So this is why we have to follow this and this is why we have to use it because it's you uh, it's uh, it's unique period that you can use in their development. From the other side, for a good number of the abilities, we have uh, two uh, similar periods. So for example, for the boys, it can be in between six and eight, and later on, you can find it in between 11 and 13. But what is the rule is that if you haven't used the first one, then unfortunately, you can't use with the same effect the second one as well. So it is also very important to know that we have different age categories or how we are evaluating the age. So the one basic that we all know it's calendar age or chronological age that we are basically using on the ordinary basis which refers on our date of birth we have also anatomical age which refers to the anatomical growth and what is most important one and that we have really focused on is biological age so what is the biological age actually it refers to the physiological development of the kids and from the other side, we are also using to evaluate the sport potential. What does it mean? If we have two kids which are on calendar age absolutely the same and uh, going to the same uh, school class, uh, it can be that uh, one of them is developing faster. So we call it early developer and someone who is probably developing a little bit into with a slower pace, we call it late developer. So it can be that they are probably the same chronology or a calendar age 10, but one can be on the biological development at age of eight and the other one can be on the age of 12, which is quite a big, big difference. So why is it important to evaluate the sport potential? Unfortunately, when we are making any kind of selection, probably for the young age categories, national teams, basically the big treat and the big uh, mistake could be that we only refer on their performance. But this biological age have to be taken into consideration in order to evaluate the potential global performance or sport potential on one young athlete who is still in development. From the other side, we are also using it in order to determine training load because we can't load the same two kids which are not on the same level of biological age. So what is the big problem also that the most of the programs that you can find that we are defining or we are using are based only on chronological age. So what the kids under eight can do or what kids under 12 can do and so on. And there are big, big number of individual differences in between them. So it is a big mistake. What we scientifically have proved, and it is absolutely clear that the at the age in between 10 and 16, those differences in biological age may be in between three and five years, which is really, really a lot. So boys as an early developer, so those who are developing much faster than the uh, other peers, they have a bigger body height, body mass, bigger, bigger strength, and usually they have a great advantage while they are competing. So if we are focusing on the early developers, probably we are not working well for the future of our sport within the top level hammer within one country. From the other side, the girls who are early developers may have a disadvantage while they are competing because of the wider dimensions 
of their own body. So what is very, very important that you develop the strategy, how to keep lay developers motivated while they are training until they reach the level of the performance of those who are a little bit earlier in development. Because very, very usually if they can't follow the pace, they can lose their own motivation and you can have a lot of drop-offs of those who are potentially very talented and probably bigger future of your sport than the others who are at that moment, particular moment, performing better. So what we did, uh, I always like uh, to refer to the to the to the publications that we are doing within our federation this is from taken from IHF teaching handball booklet done by the um, our experts um, uh, who are focusing uh, on who focused on the handball at school uh, the project and their development and who are working within the working IHF group so they have divided the whole development phases uh, um, during uh, uh, within the our sport of handball in the different phases so we have a, like a novice phase which is for the children and first stage of development from between five and eight what probably not all children are really experiencing it that's why we have the beginner phase which we are considering kids from 8 to 11 it's the second stage where the mini handball actually is the basic form of handball that they are playing one very sensitive and a very very important phase for their further development and staying in our sport is this transition phase transition to the big uh, field of handball 40 times 20 at age in between 11 and 14 but we move mostly focus for the age in between 11 and 12 and there is the let's say the transition to the uh, full handball which is uh, which is uh, taking uh, which are taking care later on uh, we have also after that a very important phase which is giving them the opportunity to join top handball it's above 17 years and uh, this is let's say another topic that has to be um that has to be taken into consideration for the other uh, other more carefully during the other sessions as well what i would like uh, to refer on is the it's something that has been done from uh, our colleagues uh, in canada they have a uh, one very important project called uh, sport for life that i'm absolutely sure that you are well informed about and uh, it takes into consideration and classification the let's say whole development of kids from their early beginning until the top level handball and even after the professional career that uh, we have a phase that we call it active for life that we are hoping that everyone who is working in sports that everyone will be active during the all light in appropriate level of loads of course so they have a uh, uh, split it into the several phases the first phase is active start that you see just on the below it's for the kids from let's say from their birth until the six years old that in this phase we are not really facing the uh, systematic training sessions it's basically we recommendation that all the kids should be uh, active on the daily level for half an hour or an hour usually it's supported by their parents sometimes in the preschool we have some organized activities but basically they are just are supporting their natural development and they are mostly um, surrounded by a lot of fun what could be the systematic start of the of certain sports it's uh, the second phase that we call fundamentals and uh, it's for the boys in between six and nine and probably girls from six to eight but taking into consideration that individual differences can be, may be made and this is the very important uh, phase because we are building up the foundation or we are building up uh, the big, big, huge base for the further development in the sport. So we are giving kids opportunity to, to achieve or to develop their fundamental uh, abilities, which may, uh, may, which may uh, uh, assure the good future 
of their development for the certain sport discipline. The next phase, which is taking, uh, which is uh, taking part uh, after the fundamental phase, it's the phase learn, learn to train for the boys in between nine and 12 and girls a little bit earlier from eight to 11. This is when the kids are still developing their physical literacy, the term that I really like, and they're building still the solid foundation for uh, for the next phases where the, the trainings are becoming more and more specific. So they are still learning how to train. So there is no major development of their abilities. But in the next phase, which is quite interesting for us, especially when we are speaking about the specialization or the coaching process, when we already have kids who are really oriented into a certain sport discipline and hopefully it would be uh, our sport, uh, handball, it's when they are training to train. And this is the phase where we are already develop, uh, the, we're focusing on development of specific uh, uh, abilities, doesn't matter their motor or physical abilities, which, were, which will uh, for sure secure the good future on the way of achieving high sport results. Later on, the training session is more oriented on competition. So that's why we call this phase train to compete. And then from 19 years or 18 years for the girls, we already have certain selection and we already know who is knocking on the doors of the professional sport. So the whole training is, is orientating towards the winning on the competition. Uh, so this is what... Actually, you can see the same model that I spoke about just uh, on the different overview. So it's the model by two leading authors who made this uh, project. Uh, these are the Bailey and Hamilton. What you can see above uh, on the line is just the age, calendar age. And what you can see uh, below, it's uh, the these are the names of those of those phases that I, they ha that I have uh, named yeah. So you can see the first phase, the fundamental learning phase, it's from six to nine. You can see the next phase is actually from learning to train, it's from nine to 12. But you can see below training to train phase is sometimes is overlapping. So when the previous phase, learning to train ends, then you can start the second phase and sometimes there are some individual differences. What you can see below on the left side is written females and males, and these are the small differences within these sensitive periods. And you can see, for example, what I mentioned for the females in between six and eight, there is the peak of speed performance or velocity. This is the golden age when we have to include in our training sessions a good number of the drills who are developing speed. You can see as well that the second phase or the second golden age for the same well, uh, for the same ability is in between 11 and 14 or 13 it's it's quite different and if you have used the first one then you can use the second one as well this is something that you can find a lot in, in literature and this is something that if you are working on this age that you have to be aware of the effect. On the right side, what you can see, we have included the same thing in our uh, booklets that I have already spoke about. So you can see that above uh, there is the good uh, instructions for the female athletes, on below you have for the males, and you can see there is a good number of the of the abilities which is written not only about the physical abilities but there is also about uh, certain uh, uh, abilities which are connected with the performance of handballs as well so uh, the first phase i want to speak a lot about it because it's uh, we we are not present so much especially in the countries where the probably handball is not so developed in some countries where handball is developed we already start probably with the baby handball in between three and uh, six years but the basic objective is to learn fundamental movements and link them 
together to play. It's also very important that knows to know that activities should be fun and and if we are using them on the daily level, they should be probably between 30 and 60 meters. Kids basically learn at that age to be active to the games by jumping, running, twisting, so I mean natural movements. And very often it's something which is uh, supporting their national development and basically it should be done or may very often is done by their parents. Uh, next phase where we are absolutely present, uh, especially uh, with the form of handball that we call mini handball, which has the absolutely central place in this development. It's for age in between six and eight, but take it uh, with certain reserve. The main objective is to learn all, but all fundamental movements, skills that could be very, very good base for the, their further development and their further spe specialization in terms of handball. So training programs that you are trying to establish have to be well structured. They have to be always a lot of positive working atmosphere and a lot of fun. Uh, physical activity can be on the daily level, but only it is well structured and well programmed. So especially about loads. And if you are using also different tools to achieve different goals. And at that age, you know very well that the kids very often are training several sports, not only probably mini handball, but they can also go for, for another sports as well, that you shouldn't probably prevent because they are just developing generally as an athletes. We have to support psychological, cognitive and emotional development. We are basically uh, uh, developing basic motor abilities like uh, speed, agility, balance, both setting and dynamic, and especially coordination, and which has to be directed towards handball especially. And we are using basic motor skills, as I already mentioned, running, throwing, catching, jumping, climbing. And what is very important to remember is that we are improving strength basically on only by using own body weight, and we are to, uh, introducing at that time also sport ethics and fair play. And you know that we have special focus in, in mini handball about that. Next phase, learning to train. That are different probably for boys and girls. So boys, uh, girls a little bit earlier, they finish this phase in between 8 and 11. And the boys around 12 years old. So the main objective of this phase is to learn overall sports skills. So this is where we are trying to establish this physical literacy and a very, very strong and wide base in order to uh, assure their further development. And uh, one of the most, this is one of the most important periods and we call it very often skills hungry years and the term that I really like to use this term. It means that in this uh, period of their development, you can use or you should use a really wide range of different uh, developing different uh, coordination and the uh, different motor abilities, because at that age, you can really, really achieve uh, high results and what is very important for the further development as well. Uh, what is very important that uh, this uh, phase actually is ending a little bit uh, before the puberty, when the next uh, phase is occurring. And what is very important to know that we are using own body weight in order to improve strength, but we can use little by little also the external loads like the medicine balls. What we are doing at that age in this phase also that we are little by little introducing psychological preparation and this is actually where we start identification of the sport talents but we will speak a little bit later about that just be aware of the fact that those identification is very important selection that you are doing on those who are talented or probably not so talented for our sport is also important so your estimation is important but it should be considered as a process and not the sudden decision what we are doing also that the periodization of the training process can be in one or the two cycles. And uh, also what is important that uh, uh, when we are developing basic or sport uh, specific uh, trainings or skills, that the range of them is 50-50%. 
When I'm mentioning the next wave is train to train. It's for the boys in between 12 and 16 years and for the girls in between 11 and 15. And we are naming it that it is one of the most important periods in development of the young handball player. So at that age, we are not probably sure, but we are almost sure that those are good candidates to stay in our sport, although that we have all, always a certain drop off of the players. So the ratio in between the uh, basic training and the specific training and competitions, which are now taking part, is 60-40. Too sensitive, uh, too sensitive. This is a sensitive period for the aerobic uh, abilities and endurance for the speed and the power. And what is the main goal of this phase is to further develop a focus on the handball specific abilities. So it means that the, the training sessions are getting more and more specific to the, uh, to the handball uh, specific conditions at that age already at 11 12 you know that there is this transition period and the, that they are just uh, uh, we that we start training on the big courts which can be also quite a sensitive period because these are all completely another conditions especially as we focus start to focus more about individual group uh, uh, abilities doesn't matter if they are technical or tactical ones so what is also uh, very important to know that training has to be done always in the spe specific conditions in four on the games and the games with a quite a comp comp competitive character, which we will speak later on about. It's very important to know that physical, mental, emotional maturity does not develop always at the same rate. So you have to focus on it and you have to take care of it as well. Especially you should have individual approach to the players depending on the level of, of their abilities. In this regard, uh, what is also very important to know that in this phase players should learn to play handball how to play handball but not to focus only on the certain positions doesn't matter is it attack on the defense so we are not really exact in this kind of the selection is anybody going to be really on the top level on the backcourt player on the backcourt position in the attack or probably some positions in defense you should still offer them wide range of opportunities for their development within the attack and defense as well. And what is also one of the very important things that you should remember that individual development is core of any success. If you see or check any kind of trend analysis during the men's or women's senior competition, you will see that every single activity or action, doesn't matter in an attack or defense, is depending on their individual skills that the, and the base of this or the, or the foundation of this is deeply uh, in the roots of their development. So if we are speaking about the teaching and coaching, uh, and this is the basically the, the main topic of, of, of this lecture, I will just uh, pass to the next slide and uh, try to define those two terms that you can find easily anywhere on this entire uh, wide internet space. So if you are checking for those two terms, you will see that teaching is... Uh, focused on the acquisition of the new knowledge and the skills. So teaching is basically which is taking mostly part in these first phases of their development. But without teaching, absolutely, we can't have a coaching because coaching is focused on the refining and developing knowledge and skills. So coaching probably is more focused on their further development and their specialization in order to achieve uh, desired goals and I suppose that all of you are desiring to promote uh, uh, future top players. So in order to teach well, we need to have a certain methods of the teaching, how we are teaching somebody or the tools that we can use. And very often I mention this and it is very important for the when we are approaching the kids in order to have the best possible results in our practice. It comes from the theory and we know very well that the sports science is applied science. So everything what comes from the theory and those scientific findings, if we cannot apply in the daily work of our coaches, then we can just put a big question mark. Is this scientific work worth it or not? 
So that's why we are basically uh, mentioning that we can use analytic methods as a teaching method. We can use synthetic method and combined method. What could be analytic approach, analytic method? When we have certain complex uh, motion that we can't teach immediately and just by showing to the kids and repeating yeah so we have to share or to split this uh, split this motion within the phases and then we just learn phase by phase and you probably by having your own experience you would understand if i say that without this analytic method we will never learn how to swim because if you just throw the kids into the water and you just they start to swim, I'm not sure that you will achieve high results. But if you start splitting them into certain phases that they learn first how to breathe, then they learn how to make leg work, then how to make the arm work, and then you just put all together, then probably you could achieve some results as well. On opposite sides, we have the synthetic method that we or warmly recommend that you do the, when you're teaching kids that you should use it as much as possible. So you shouldn't split any kind of motion into the certain phases and then to learn phase by phase because there is a big tree that you will they, they, they will, you will use in between those in the joints or in between those phases you will use this smooth flow that you need especially when we are talking about the pace or about the rhythm of certain certain uh, individual element doesn't matter is it in attack or defense sometimes it's not possible that's why I will especially focus on synthetic method that could be done in simplified conditions so that you can use the whole motion, but you can simplify these conditions. These simplified conditions may be done by the coach, so he needs to have a certain knowledge about it, but it can be also done with the certain tools that we are using that are helping them to learn entire skill. From the other side, probably that you will use the most of the time is the combined method that you are combining one and the other. So it can be that you are, just to give you an example, that you are learning kids to make a probably jump shot and you just show them how to do it. You can use some cones or you can use some other other two other tools equipment in order to make them well orientated as orienteers you can probably be a little bit blind if they're making one or, or a step more yeah but you can probably notice why they're using this entire or implementing entire technique that they are in the some sensitive phases of the of the entire technique that they are making some failures then you can stop them and then you can just analytically just do a certain movement when they are just standing in the place and you just show them how to lift up the arm or to lift up the, the swinging uh, swinging leg the knee up yeah and when they are just doing repeating correcting then you can probably do another drill where they're doing the same but passing to each other and then you can just switch once again to an entire uh, technique of shooting by implementing the jump shot but just to show it to you clearly, how this uh, simplified synthetic method like may look like, I will just make you an example of the lateral ground overarm shot. And now we just play video right now that I cannot probably slide like this. So I have to change, sorry for that. So this is not so important to that I'm doing first the demonstration, how we are doing it, but you will see just in the next, uh, okay. So they are just passing by me. I'm the one who is simplifying those conditions. I'm the helping hand, yeah. So I'm just handing over the ball and the, we are trying to give them the simple instructions. So they have, to, they have to run towards the goal. They just focus to grab the ball with the both hands. And just during the, probably the demonstration, what you saw, I was insisting on the first, step with the left uh, foot front with for those who are right handers yeah and what is also what was very important that to focus they have the in this during making those steps that they take a lateral positions with the uh, with the show the left shoulder towards the goal what you will probably see yeah and what i'm doing right now i'm helping them in order to get them into the right position so if you probably check it's corrected it could be right positions and after a while i give them opportunity to shoot on the goal 
So this is what you see. I help them. Okay, lateral position, left foot in front. As you see, they have a good position. And then from this position, they can perform. So the next step in this uh, methodological order could be that I'm not anymore helping them. So they know exactly what is the position. So we have the smooth flow of the whole, whole, uh, whole uh, uh, technique. Uh, they are committing also the mistakes. The mistakes are part of their learning. Yeah, But at least I'm not pushing them in, into the this initial position, not correcting, but they have the smooth flow of the whole technique. So this was the step, probably step number two. And the step number three could be that uh, they don't have contact uh, with me through the goal. So they are passing and they are catching ball by themselves. But this is also simplified conditions, not the double pass. Ball is still at the same position when it was when I was passing the ball for them. But they have to focus to, to get into the initial position, right initial position by themselves. Of course, probably you can't hear it, but that you can see that activity of the coach is still present I'm all the time giving them the feedbacks what they have to correct and what they have to probably remember for the next uh, next uh, uh, activities yeah but from the other side I mentioned that we have also analytic approach and those analytic approach we have basically when we have when we want to uh, focus on certain details yeah and you know that uh, probably the uh, the outcome of the implementation of certain the, the, uh, of certain technique would it be correct or wrong depends how they are accurate in the implementation or performance in the certain details yeah so to be i'm just giving an example of the single faint so to be successful in fainting, you have to achieve or to fulfill certain conditions. Yeah. One of the conditions is probably where are you making this faint? If you are too far away from the opponent, you are fainting the space in front of him. You're not fainting him. If you are too close to him, uh, then you are probably very easy target that he can grab and you can prevent your activity from the other side is also very important what are the directions of our movements so that's why the steps or the foot feet they have to be parallel it's very important that if we are implementing the the single feint we have to take care that the first step is just uh, straightforward and the next one should be parallel so we don't open our foot on one of the sides because we have to pass just next to the player or between two the players if we open our second our foot during the second step then we are probably not directing our our uh, motion towards the goal but we are running towards the player who is playing just in the zone next to this player just in order to show you how it uh, uh, looks like we will just start with this analytic approach so you can see it's a uh, best possible demonstrator it's me so we are just focusing here on the on the the first step of the feint doesn't matter is the single feint in one on the other side yeah so we are just trying to attack the player on side yeah so we are trying to in the this first phase faking phase we are trying to convince him that we will pass next to him on one on the other side and what is very important you see that he has uh, full extending arms in front this is very important orienteer for myself so i can check if i'm too close if i achieve the contact uh, if i make a contact with his hands so it means that i'm too close but if i see when i stop that i'm not enough close then i have every single attempt to correct myself so this is very analytic but we focus just on the first step of of our faint so the kids they are just very very close they're not making any kind of run up they are just trying to uh, put the whole load on the front uh, step on the front uh, on the front uh, sorry foot and uh, also to check if they have the body upright if they're accurate into the space if the foot is just straight ahead and so on so on afterwards in very slow motion 
they can do the other parts. Sometimes they are doing, we are doing just the second part. And then we just by walking are just trying to connect one and the other. Then we have it also with a double pass and you can just see easily the progression, how it will look like. Always we are doing it in one and the other side. And then you can see later on, this is the same thing, but just from the other perspective, we are making also run-ups. So we are more running towards the player. So the pace is getting faster and faster. And then you will see that you we are getting the passes from one and the other side, which is more specific for the uh, playing conditions. We can do it also in the groups and on the end we are trying to implement everything what i mentioned in the specific conditions and the more specific condition then it's after the fainting we are of course shooting towards the goal what is also very important although we are working in this kind of analytic approach and conditions it's very important to focus on the certain pace or the rhythm of the of the of the of the sorry the actual technique that we are speaking about so from the very first moment you have to learn kids that there are two phases one is the fake phase another one is the real movement yeah so when we are faking this part is a little bit slower and the second part has to be very very fast so from the very first steps of their learning, we have to learn them to do it on the right. If they are not achieving the or learning the actual pace that they have to do, then you have you can face uh, the problems later on in this, uh, the next development phases. Why? Because if they are uh, the, uh, the performing a certain technique with the same uh, failure, then the failure can be so much stabilized than the process of uh, of uh, demolishing or uh, of or demolishing this failure is very 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 complex and on the end we can just show on the other side how could be the synthetic approach and it is the next drill that you can see the this is drill made by one of my colleagues that really appreciate so you have the kids who are just keeping those mats you see and in the last phase of their fainting they're just opening one of the spaces that by implementing one of the fates uh, the kids they have to use and then you can see on the transformation within the game, this is absolutely the same situation that was designed by one of the coaches who was using it in the earlier phase of their development. So the forms of teaching are also very important. Why? Because you are trying to establish the great uh, foundation for their further development. And then the small-sided games, they have really, really special place in the development or teaching of the kids. Why, first of all, the children, they have natural need to play. And from the other side, is a great driving force. Through the game, you can achieve the high level of motivation and also high level of execution. So you can have from strict forms of the, of the exercises, but probably they won't be highly motivated to execute it on the level how you did. From the other side, you know very well that one of the tasks of the coach is to achieve or, or to design the positive working atmosphere in order to achieve those goals. And I'm sure that by implementing the right games, you can do it. From the other side, you have to design them and you have a wide range of the of, uh, of, of, of choices that you can make by yourself is that uh, all those games, they have to be challenging. You have to be just right to the, to the needs of the kids and their own performance. So if the games or your activities are too low or they are not on the level of their development, then probably you won't achieve a certain results. But if they are too demanding, it can be a problem as well. So they have just to be right as possible to challenge their further development of their abilities. From the other side, it's very important to use them because the games usually they are free, they are spontaneous and they are various. So they are not patterned. And one of the very important games in the, their development, it's also mini handball. Why? Because you can't design and you can't predict in which kind of the technical, tactical or, or, or game situations the kids will face. And naturally or spontaneously, they are trying to make their own choices. So you're not guiding them. They're guided by themselves. And very often what happens, 
that uh, you can be really surprised that the kids are implementing certain abilities or they're implementing certain technical elements of the game that you didn't really focus on and that you really didn't teach them as probably some kind of fainting, which are kind of their inv invention that they did in combination of the change of the pace, change of the direction together by using a dribbling, for example. From the other side, what you shouldn't forget is that by giving this kind of the fashion, you are trying to secure our future of our sport. And you know very well that everyone would like to have in the junior, on the top level, uh, level handball, would like to have creative players. Without the creative players, we can't achieve mastery and excellence in our sport. If you didn't work on their creativity and that certain stage of, the, of development, then they won't uh, face it anywhere. So it's very important condition for the creative, for the developing of the creativity. What I can say from my personal experience that unfortunately we have a, we we wasted a lot of probably talented players during the young age categories, especially when speaking in the young uh, young national teams. So we had the players which we focus a lot that we can be overloaded we pretty pretty much both on the physical, technical, and tactical. Uh, and unfortunately, all those play a good number of those players we almost for we forgot their names. If I mention certain name that which really that we focus in the junior stage. Probably, I'm sure that even my country, they won't know who they are. But we know a good number of outstanding players who really promoted our sport a lot, who were part of those national teams, but they played the second row. And they haven't been so much overloaded and they kept their creativity and their certain pace of their own development. What is also very important to know, it is that... Uh, uh, while you are planning this training process, you have to focus when you are teaching them you and coaching them, you have to focus on certain things. These are the key coaching points that you have to plan. And these are those small methodological advices and uh, that will open the doors of the success. So these are the small advices that you are giving them when you they, they are so they're, they're, they're facing certain certain difficulties. So, for example, we have those pistol movements that we are doing all the time during the attack. Pistol movements for, for all those who probably do not know what, what is this term. It's when we are doing the with the ball run up towards the goal and we are trying to attack direct opponents or certain space on different ways. And you can see that technically everybody is doing it well. But something is quite missing in order to achieve this tactical importance of this movement. And this is that they are not really ready or convincing the players that they are really attacking the goal. So you have to say, whenever you are doing a pace movement, attack the goal and be ready to break through and shoot. This is very important methodological advice. But something which is proved that gave really, really excellent results in um, in our work is this guided discovery. What is this guided discovery? So this is also kind of pedagogical influence that we are trying to do, that we are planning. And it is where that when you are designing the questions and you are writing them, and by giving the answer or you are guiding them to make a discovery and to make the right choice. So we can have the pistol movements in between the players, yeah? But when they are collaborating, something is wrong because when one player is attacking, you have another player just next to who is expecting the ball and who is trying to, to get the ball on the right moment because he has to make a certain part of the, of the run up without the ball in order to achieve certain speed and then to attack the, the goal with uh, with the ball uh, to attack the goal with the ball after certain run up without the ball and you can see that something is not working then you as a coach if you have planned it well you can just stop the activity and you can just ask a question to every one of them who are present and you can ask okay when the when the player without the ball starts running towards the goal and you can probably get a different answer. Some of them could be wrong. Some of them could be right. And the right answer could be or should be that when player with the ball ends his activity and by raising hand up, 
in order to endanger the goal. This is the moment when the player next to him has to start. If it was right, you just uh, uh, repeat it or you just do it by yourself. And then the, all the kids, you spread the, 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 the this information such efficiently that everyone can get it and you are certain that they know. And these are the questions connected with the individual tactics. And we spoke about that. And this is about how, why, when, and where. These are basically the questions. So I would like also to speak a little bit about the different forms of handball in these transition phases, because this is phases when you start coaching and then we can have a really big drop off of players. Even the very well established uh, uh, federations like probably Denmark and France and Serbia, they're all facing that after mini handball, during the mini handball phase until 11 years old, you have really big number of players, but then unfortunately, if you just pass over the big, uh, big uh, court of handball, you will start working very, very specifically, then probably you will have a big number of drop off because it's not anymore so interesting for the kids as it was during the mini handball phase where they all took uh, uh, part of the game where they all were very, very active. It was very, very dynamic. They were shooting a lot. They were having uh, lots of activities, shooting on both sides and scoring the goal, which is the most important for them. So that's why certain federations are really taking care of it. And they are just trying to establish different forms of handball, which are the most uh, appropriate for the kids at that age in order to continue their further development to continue coaching and uh, uh, and uh, continue uh, the process of the whole specialization for our sport. So this is one of the forms which is implemented in certain countries. In certain countries, they are aiming it to make as a competition. My advice is not to keep it as a competition, but you can keep it as a training form for sure. And you can probably use it as a form of the game within the schools and you can more make some kind of uh, unofficial competitions in between the classes. So actually we have a team which is split it on two sides. On one side, we have a three players plus the goalkeeper. You see probably the three, three yellow players. And on the other side, you have additional three players in total six. So the team is split it by the middle line on the two halves. As you see, the ball is on the left side, so the goalkeeper is intending to place the ball into the game. So we are playing basically man to man. So the team in this first half is aiming to just play with the ball and to pass the ball as on the secure way as soon as possible to the teammates who are in the second half. Also, one important rule that the players, neither from one on the other side, are not allowed to pass across this middle line. Then you have additional three players who are also collaborating with the aim of achieving or scoring the goal. At the same time, scoring or not, on the opposite way, we have the same situation by the red players. So you can define your internal rules so you can prevent uh, players to bounce the ball. If they are not bouncing the ball, then the players without the ball in possession, they have to focus more on the game without the ball. You can also try to establish the right uh, decision making that you can just uh, say that they can have only one bounce of the ball, one dribbling. So they are just estimated by themselves where to use it on the best possible way. You can just uh, tell them to that they can uh, play freely. You can also, if there is any uh, need for assistance, you can make one on both sides. On one side, the, the joker, the player who's only playing with the ball, is not shooting on the goal, so he's only playing with the team who is having ball in possession. You can have on each side one joker. You can play each side one joker who are allowed to cross the cross the middle line. Or you can also allow the player who is passing the last pass to the players to cross the line. So they are in the attack playing four against three. But it can be also a treat because after getting ball into possession by the goalkeeper, was doesn't matter was it a goal or not, then this a player has to make a very, very quick retreat because then they're going to have, there would be the man up situation for the opponent team. So uh, there is also there is also 
a transition phase that the teams very often are, or teams of federations are instructing that uh, uh, teams have to play more individual. So we are implementing man-to-man -man defense. This is something that we are doing on our faculty with the students. So day one, when they, we, they, when we meet them on the, on the court, students with completely different uh, experiences coming from different sports, they are able to play the game while they are just covering one single opponent. From one side, uh, they are able to cover only one opponent and not the space. But from the other side, we give still the opportunity for the further development of individual skills because the players are really in the wide range of motion, implementing all the individual skills and also group collaboration. This is probably the too demanding, but what you can see more in certain federations is that the rules of the games or the regulations are that the kids of 11, 12 should play man to man, but on the half of the court. And what is for sure at the age of 11 happening, they are doing the same uh, thing, but in the shooting range. I will just give you one more example, and there are more examples as well. Uh, my federation has a such a regulation, so we're still, uh, still uh, until age of 14, the, the players or the teams are not allowed to play the flat defenses, so they have to play defenses to two rows, open defenses. Uh, sometimes it's a zone 3-3 three, three or 3-2-1 three, or the defense only 5-1. But what is very important to know here that we are still implementing individual responsibility so if you see all these players in the front line they are taking care only about the backward players and you the second line one of them the middle one is taking care of the line player and uh, the the wings are covered by the players the last ones the first and the last one in the row so we are still having one against one but we are introducing one uh and it doesn't react now i don't know why Okay, I will just change to that. So what is very important, the core of every single attack is two against two. So we first time introduce, it's not really collaboration between line line player and the backcourt player like pick and roll, but there is a certain collaboration that we are opening, at least by opening new spaces and by assisting the line player that hasn't happened before uh, within the mini handball. From the other side, we are also may make the transition of one of the players so backcourt players and the line player and the wing players can make a transition on the position of the second line player and the rule for the for the for the defense players is still to maintain individual approach and they have to follow the player within their path so they are not uh, making any kind of transformation but with the next slide which is very important this is that within the new conditions, and the new conditions are the sizes of our court, is that we are establishing or also introducing the new phase of the game. It's a counterattack. So that's why usually those front line is it's covered by the two wings. So left wing and the right wing on one and the other side. And also uh, on, the, on the front, the center position we have the line player and those are the players who are actually responsible for the worst first wave of the counter-attack probably we don't really have at that age the first wave that uh, the ball was is assist or uh, thrown by the goalkeeper but at least then the, the second line which consists of the middle center back and two backcourt players left and right then they are trying to establish in the second wave and we are trying to play the speed handball with them as well i will just show you one video but i have just to change the view this is the uh, actually the i got from one of our colleagues she is from portugal and this is the same rules what you can see that they are playing zone three against three in certain moments you can see that they are playing very very deep and we have one uh, team on the right side it's a dark blue which is playing probably more more than handball and on the left side more static handball you have an early developers obviously on the right back who is not really moving well on the court but it doesn't mean that uh, he doesn't have perspective in this regard 
but uh, you will see that they are trying to implement certain elements of the game by attacking the ball, by attacking the player and the passing line and trying to prevent every single activity of the attack on the best possible way. You can see the all the players on the of the dark blue, they are covering the player correctly with or without the ball. They are always in the stance. They are moving in the stance and moving on the or in the in the in the defense as well. With this kind of activity, they get very very often in position to uh, to intercept the pass, as you see the previously. And this is the connection in between attack and the defense, because by playing a certain defense, it uh, takes also a certain adaptation of attack. So you can never implement drills only for attack or only for a defense. So within this attack, when we are playing deep, then of course the players, they have to play more without the ball. They have to move without the ball, especially with a certain timing. So they have to move and to receive the ball by attacking also the joints in between two players. And as you see that the, this kind of defense is orientated in order to provoke uh, more uh, uh, mistakes done or failures done by the attack. You can see on the, also on the dark blue team, that uh, obviously by implementing this kind of defense, they are used to play more dynamic and speed up uh, the ball, especially when they are getting the ball, they don't spend a lot of time with the ball when they are attacking the goal. And these are the adaptations absolutely which are done by implementing these kind of the systems. As the players in the defense play more deep, what is another adaptation? They are used to make good number of different kinds of uh, of uh, fakes or feints, but they have to combine them as they are quite far away from the goal. They have to combine them with the dribbling. So it is the additional value of this uh, form of handball. You will see later on there are very there are a lot of white spaces, to, so they are also having this kind of good sense of reading the game, entering into end of say, space to get the ball, like it was on the previous attack. And from the other side, you will see that there are a good number of good collaboration with this regard with the line player as well. So obviously that the dark blue team is uh, did a better adaptation in this moment. You see one more uh, one more interception of the ball, and very very fastly they get into the position of scoring the goal. So it was enough to get the impression what was my aim so there is the basic question how to build up a handball champion and i'm certain that you want you don't get very often uh, the strict or the straight uh, straight answer and then basically you have mostly to explore by yourself so there are quite many philosophies especially when we are speaking about different handball schools and, in, and it is something that we should really, really preserve the identity of certain handball schools that we admired very much, this variety of understanding and playing in handball of different way. So the condition coaches, they usually have the expressions that there are as many philosophies of strength and training uh, system as there are iron plates in the weight room. So there is not unique path that you should follow and in order to achieve the certain goal. So if I did something, by myself, with my teams, and if you just copy paste, probably you won't achieve the same results. So there are many philosophies, but what is very important to understand the some training uh, principles, we have to preserve them as a constant and we have really to remain them. One of the, of the, of the principle is that we have always need to have the individual approach. So there is no single path to be followed in order to reach desired goals. So something that worked for one player doesn't mean that will work with another player as well. This individual approach has to be also done when, because the handball is really, there is a great variety of different techniques and variations that can be implemented and executed. If you are trying to do everything with everyone, I'm not sure that you will achieve great goals. So you have to recognize something, what the player can do with a high level of performance in order to achieve excellence in this performance in our sports.
So what is very important for you, and I mentioned already, that you have to really to follow the phases of the children's development. So all the characteristics that we spoke about, biological, physiological, social, and so on. And this, in this regard, you have to be really well, well informed. From the other child sides, uh, if you are co coach on the high level or highly educated of PE teachers, they are basically well informed about that. And these are the coaches who should work in these development phases. From the other side, the training process has to support nature and bi biological development of the kids. And there are not shortcuts in this regard. From the other side, one also very important rule is that you should never apply the, with the children training session with grown-ups. So the copy-paste system, it doesn't exist. Why? Because the training loads are usually the adaptations, body adaptation process. So you know, whatever you perform, the, the, to the whatever you perform, there is the adaptation on it. And if you are using the most effective tools in order to achieve higher results, then later on, you won't be able to use them on the same level as it was. What is very important to remember that children's sport should have a perspective character. So aim of your work shouldn't be that you achieve highest possible results in the very uh, early age of the development. You have to make everything well done and you have to do, uh, you have to work uh, on, the, on the wide, wide, uh, wide uh, foundation in order to achieve best results when it is the most appropriate for our sport game and it is in, this, uh, in, the, in the senior stage. So we are not evaluating your work by achieving the competition results. We are evaluating your work, how many, uh, how many top players you have produced. And this is your main goal. So what is your task and what we have to do? So first of all, we have to do the multi, the lateral development of all, uh, all uh, capabilities. So we have to make the strong base for the future further development and our specialization. And first of all, to improve the fundamental skills of handball. So we have to, uh, to, to build up the kids or to, to develop them as a general traits. So if we have such a strong, uh, strong, uh, strong uh, base, then we can achieve high results. So we have a weak base, you can't, uh, you can't uh, build up a big house, but if you have a strong base, then your house can be even the skyscraper. In this regard, in certain countries, in my country as well, there's a big tradition. We have the sports schools when they are mainly focusing on improvement of the basic skills. So like running, jumping, throwing, a lot of gymnastics, for sure. Even they are learning them how to swim and skiing. And with this foundation, then we can easily transfer them to the sports that they are basically having uh, motivation to join and also certain ta talents. I mentioned already sensitive periods. This is a must. You have to follow it. And also what you are basically doing during this process, you are doing your talent identification. Of course, the biggest aim or the biggest goal is to join or to make high handball performance, but you are basically doing through the selection and please remember the selection is process. You have always to give kids the time. So it's not a sudden decision. From the other side, what we are trying to not establish, but we are, I think in most of the countries, top level countries we have, we are following the development in the certain phases of the top players. And we are making this specific model of top handball player. And of course, for in this regard, to have the high handball on the highest possible performance, we have an adequate uh, number of coaches and experts and pedagogues as well. This specific model can be like a mathematical model. It is what you can see just here below. These are the all competencies or abilities that we are actually Having these are the most specific ones. I won't speak about them. It's probably too scientific news for you. We have a certain consequent, and is this, if, if this index is higher, then this, uh, this for achieving highest result, this uh, ability is more specific. 
But from the other side, what we can get from you is the best information. And best information is the field information. So we already a long, long time ago, we spoke and we, uh, we mentioned that uh, handball players, they can have to be from their side of technical and, and physical ability side, they have to be like a decathlon athletes. And you can imagine what kind of level is it is. It is. But your first task absolutely is to give children opportunity to play, to enjoy handball, and then you will have better possibility for good selection as well. What are the field informations that probably you could take care of? But I think the list is much longer that I would give you, but I'm try just trying to be as shorter as possible. So for sure, these are good motor skills, especially good coordination with the ball. Then from the other side, for the good or the high level of handball, it's very important that the kids are having good reading of the game or sense for the game, how to play the handball or how to outplay the direct components and what kind of fluency of ideas they have. From the other side, we also need strong competitive agility. And basically, we can split all the players that you are working with on two types of the players. So one is competitive, one is demonstrators, and the other one are competitors. So who are the demonstrators? Demonstrators are those who are really having excellence in the execution of technical, technical aspects. And they are very, especially very good role models. And during the training session, they are performing very well. But the competitors are those who are probably having low, lower, little bit lower level of their abilities that I've mentioned, but they are always best during the competition. So we, you know, probably that even during the um, training sessions of some athletes, they were jumping over the world records, but during the competition, they, they didn't execute this kind of potential. So that's why we have to focus most on competitors, but do not forget that for the development of the competitors, the demonstrators are also very important. So you ha should have demonstrators in your teams as well. And one very important uh, part of the talent you have mentioned you have seen a lot good number of the talented players but they were not really ready for the hard work and this readiness for the hard work should be really part of their talent because without hard work any kind of achievements may be done and probably only one morphological dimension it's the palm dimension you know that it's very important for us. Before I remember that we were measuring it, both sides, uh, the width and the length of the palm. So especially this planimetric uh, the diameter, which goes on the, from the top of the toe till the top of the pinky of the last finger. But nowadays, as we are having uh, lots of additional equipment or like a group, probably it's not one of the most important things, but the good strikers, I'm sure they have the big palms and this could be one of the orientation for your work. So just to mention a little bit, what is the difference in between competitors and demonstrators or the winners and the losers? Winners, they have always a plan, but losers, they have an excuse. Winners, they focus more on winning, but losers, losers they are more afraid of losing. And on the end, winners may things happen and losers wait for things to happen. And this could be probably one of uh, one of the uh, one of the motions for you. Uh, we I did mention during the mini handball, especially in certain uh, certain uh, countries, especially when I mentioned that the the development of the uh, girls can be much faster when we are speaking about uh, this fast growth phase. So very often in between 9 and 11, girls are probably taller than the boys or more powerful than the boys. And in certain countries where the, this cultural background, it doesn't uh, conflict with it. We have uh, very often that within the mini handball, we don't only have boys teams. We don't have only the men, uh, women, uh, female, uh, girls teams, but we have also mixed teams, what you can see on the picture on the right side. But there are certain differences for sure. All those who are working with the boys and the girls, they know the differences are present. But from the other side, at that stage of their development, they can play together and they are in certain countries playing together. But what are the differences? The boys, they are more orientated to the performance. 
And for sometimes it's just enough to the kids to give them opportunity to play. And when, when they are choosing the teams that they would like to play, they're always trying to make the choices, uh, personal choices, because uh, by uh, willing to play with the best players they can. From the other side, when you give the similar opportunity to the girls, you will understand they are more personally orientated. So if the best friend is playing, they will join as well. And when they are making their own choices, they are always uh, trying to choose uh, to play only with the best friend. As I am father of two girls, I'm very aware of the fact that also very often in if one of the best friends stops uh, or drops off or stops training, then the other one is, is doubting as well. Or they also, when they want to start certain uh, sport, they are also going if the best friend or the good friend is going as well. I'm approaching to the end of my presentation. I hope that my typing is perfect, especially if I spoke about my further plans. Uh, and always on the end, I'm trying to give a tribute to the coaches or the, to the teachers that I was learning from. And uh, this is something that it is uh, very important because usually teachers, they are uh, inspiring us and uh, for Is everything fine? Uh, you dropped off a bit. The image block, we could hear you, but now we can't see you. So uh... uh -huh. let me let me check just what is going on. Uh... We can see the presentation, but we can see you. I'm not so important, I suppose. <laughs> uh... Uh, but uh, a video, a video stopped. I don't know why. So am Perfect. I back? Yes. So what is the last that you hear from me? Uh, okay. Said, yeah, yeah. You okay. said that you are going to and mention. By, and I, and I by yeah, sorry. And by appreciating their work and continuing their work, we are also prolonging their work and prolonging our development of our sport. Yeah. So I would just mention a quotation of one of them, and uh, it is that. Uh, the great, the great coach is one who creates athletes who are greater than him. And I hope that you will be on that path. Thank you very much for your attention. And if there are any questions, I will be very eager to give you uh, right answers. Only right answers. Thank you, Milan, for the presentation. Of course, we have some questions. Um, the first ones are uh, in regards of age. So at what age should uh, children start to dribble, to learn to dribble? And uh, regarding also the age, best defenses for age categories. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, just a technical question. Uh, do, do we keep this? Uh, do I stop sharing now or? Uh... Whatever you want. Whatever you want, it's it's okay. You can you can talk also with because the quote is inspirational also. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, there are different understandings concerning the dribbling. Uh, I can just tell you what are my experiences because there is I think uh, within different schools different understanding. In some countries, this is the first element that the pay, player uh, players are trying to start to control the ball and making some kind of specific uh, coordination within the ball. So handling, bouncing, throwing the ball and catching once again is always combined. In my in handball, in handball school that I am belonging, this is the first element of the game because that uh, also, when you have the slight contact during the dribbling, it's also ball handling when you are handling the ball by one hand when you're shooting. So your fingers are apart, yeah, you have the slight contact, and then grabbing the ball could be easier. Some of the schools try to establish that the passing and catching is the basic element, but I think that you can do it parallel at the same time. Very often about the decision making, there is a problem within the coaches when the kids are playing mini handball, they think that there will be too much individual, they will keep the ball as much as possible, they won't collaborate in between them if you are offering them the bouncing. But from the other side, I'm sure that you will be very, very happy if you will establish the right decision making from the first step. In, in their in their development because if you have a player who has the 
right empty space in order to bounce the ball to run alone in the counter attack and the shoot towards the goal and he cannot because you preventing you won't be so happy so that i'm starting from the very early childhood to establish this self-awareness when and what to do so very often i just show them literally how one one uh, bounce of the ball can be more than enough because within the i just place myself on one of the lines i just running three steps and then within the rules i just explain them that then when i grab the ball and uh, they catch the ball we can make additional at least one or two steps and then we can make uh, within the within the rules three more steps and i show them what kind of space i earned by just one bounce and i have to admit that in the practice i really didn't have so much problems about it from the other side you explain them that if you are bouncing too much you're an easy target so you can lose the ball easy and then you will be you won't be happy if you score if the opponent team is scoring goal and for sure within the mini handball the game is so dynamic that they don't have such a, a big space for rebuilding a lot so this is what i'm just trying to introduce Produce and guide. And from the other side, uh, you mentioned the systems in the defense, but can you just be more specific? Or probably I can read by myself. Uh, yeah, uh, no, what it, was the question? The question was: uh, At what age do you need to teach uh, different uh, defensive systems? You've mentioned it that in early ages you will uh, use, and also in Serbia, for example, because it's it's your expertise there. They are playing three on three until 14 years old, if I remember correctly, right? Ah, no, no. This is just the no. This is just the form of the form of the game that you can use. And I'm I'm just training in the training reasons that you shouldn't probably use too much. And in certain countries, it's not from Serbia. I have to admit, it was idea that also this competition can be organized, which is informal competition. It's more the games that kids are playing in this regard, which is far away from the form of handball that we have to achieve. But from the other side, if we are talking about the systems, the main systems in the mini handball is man, uh, man to man. So they are only able to establish this kind of system because, first of all, they can't take care of the space. They can't take care about the shifting in between the players. They can just take care of one individual player who is running everywhere, covering him when he is having ball in possession and without. For the second uh, second uh, quality of this game is they are learning how to be always in the stance, how to slide in the stance, and how to run into the defense because it's absolutely different as well. And from the other side, you have to have this kind of individual approach because then you will see when in my country and other countries, when we start the game, you have always the coaches who are intervening when they are trying to find the best possible opponent for their uh, player because you have at the same time I told, told I already mentioned the, the great the diversity diversity and the and the in their development and the, and the differences so the, the the smaller ones are just taking care of the smaller ones who are faster ones the probably those who are more powerful are taking care of more powerful the taller ones against taller ones probably if we have mixed teams boys against girls so you can find the appropriate opponent that he can implement these individual skills when we are speaking about the systems, when we transfer the kids from the small core to the big core, then we start to implement the best possible uh, system that will uh, uh, en encourage and then will support the further development of their skills. And these are mostly these open, let's say, or deep differences. It can be different. It can be 3-3, three, three, three. it can be 5-1, it can be 3-2-1, and these are the, basically the examples of still man-to-man, -man, which is really endangering the structure of our game, which certain countries are using it. And uh, within these deep differences, I have to admit, in my country for the long, long time, one of the pre-exercises for 3 to one which was an actional product, and which I still think that should be used during the development of the kids from 14 or 15 years, for us, 5-1 was one of the differences that we'd use as a pre-exercise to learn the certain position and motion and the technique and tactics of the defense. And uh, this is also used in France as well. First of all, it's used as an individual uh, covering system. And then, it, then in the later stage of the development, 15, 16, 17, it's more used as a zone. You've answered one of our questions um, with the last part of your answer because there was a question regarding uh, using smaller courts or half courts for kids aged six to nine. 
So uh, the kids age six to nine do not play on full courts, uh, correct, Milan? Absolutely, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Everywhere in the world. And uh, also it's giving you great variety because usually if you are use, if you are using the official court, handball court, you can you can use, you can just play not over the length of over the width of the court. So the court is is along 20 meters times 13 or 15 meters yeah from the other side in my country best that i mentioned already basketball is very recognized sport we are using also basketball courts and the three point line we are using as a line of the goalkeeping area so this court is probably a little bit longer and uh, also from the other side it doesn't mean that if you don't have regular sizes of the court you shouldn't implement handball because within the schools it's very easy to implement if the sizes of your courts within the schools are shorter probably or smaller then you can just reduce one player and very often we play mini handball for four plus one or it can be played three plus one three players on the court and one player on the goal so one last question, Milan. Uh, what advice would you give to beginner coaches, the coaches who are just starting uh, handball, uh, to coach handball and to coach uh, children? But yeah, I, I, I'm, uh, I have some sound. Is everything fine? And uh, now we can't see you again, but we can hear you. Uh -huh. now okay. it's so, so I'm back. Huh? Yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, I'm quite enough older to, to, to probably just uh, uh, make some perspectives so recapitulations of my life and uh, i'm quite grateful that i uh, i took this uh, path because i took path of staying in sports which i really admired and which i really love and i think that i'm gifted because of that and if i would uh, have to estimate my uh, myself, my characteristics, or my uh, my uh, best possible sides of of my character, I will have to thank or I will have to show my gratitude a lot towards the sports that I was playing. And I think that I'm mostly build it up as I am because of taking part of my sports. And I'm absolutely sure when I'm working with the students and when I'm working with my participants of my courses or my players, that if you are sharing the love of your sport, they can easily recognize and that they can be easily, easily affected by it and also inspired by it. So uh, I think that this is the one of the biggest, uh, uh, biggest uh, conditions that you have uh, to achieve because if you love it and if you know if you can share this love and this positive working atmosphere i think you have you can uh, achieve uh, very very good results i'm sure that every one of you if are loving this sport will be enough honest to sh spend some time in their if in their personal development because only by playing handball is not enough to work as a coach this is a very good base and if you were really uh, strict with yourself, honest with yourself for uh, spending a lot of energy while playing, why you shouldn't be honest with yourself by sharing your, uh, your energy for the further development for your next career. I always, when I'm speak speaking with my former players, I'm just trying to make some kind of clear associations or clear pictures to be plastic, let's say. And I'm always saying that if I will, if I'm a good driver and I know how to drive the car and what is reflecting to their sports career, still I'm not mechanical engineer, so I don't know how to construct the engine. And in order to be good. Uh, good uh, mechanical engineer I have to spend time in this regard and knowing to drive will be quite helpful thank you very much Milan for your presentation and for your answers we conclude the 2023 IHF Children's Handball Education Week here after seven interesting webinars um, this week is uh, done and dusted thank you very much uh, for attending have a nice weekend and goodbye Thank you all and I wish you all the best in implementing all this knowledge that I hope that you heard something that was useful for you for yourself, at least if we just uh, um, were a little small driving force for your own thoughts and that you build it your own ideas, we can be really satisfied about it. Thank you very much and goodbye.